Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Kepki Bhatia, SR Woman of Mumbai, and I welcome you all to another session of Kitab, an initiative of the Prabha Khetan Foundation, presented by Sri Cement Limited. Today's session is in association with Penguin Random House India. Established by late Dr. Prabha Khetan in the 1980s, Prabha Khetan Foundation provides platforms for caregivers, committed individuals, and like-minded institutions to implement cultural, educational, literary, and social welfare projects in India. The pandemic has not been able to deter the Foundation's noble cause. The Foundation has shifted gears using the virtual world to continue with the various sessions to keep up the spirit of its patrons. The birth of a book always calls for celebration. Kitab provides a platform to authors to display and showcase their newest literary works before a discerning audience and media through tastefully curated book launches. Today, we have with us the Honorable Justice Rohinton Pali Nariman. Justice Nariman is a former judge of the Supreme Court of India. He was trained to become a priest at the tender, tender age of 12. He holds a master's degree from the Harvard Law School. He was designated at a sea, as a senior advocate at the age of 37 by the then Chief Justice Venkata Chalaya. Despite the age for the designation being 45, rules were specially amended for him to be elevated. He served as the Solicitor General of India from 2011 to 2013, before becoming a Supreme Court judge in 2014, making him only the fifth person to be elevated directly from the bar. He is an expert in constitutional law, commercial law, and arbitration law. He has over 500 reported Supreme Court judgments to his credit. A committed daily walker, he is extremely passionate about Western classical music and history. Today at Kitab, Justice Nariman's new book, Discordant Notes, Volume 2, published by Penguin Random House India, will be launched. To mark the occasion, we have with us three distinguished legal experts with us. Justice B. N. Sri Krishna, judge, former Judge of the Supreme Court of India, Justice Gautam Patel, Judge of Bombay High Court, and Mr. Darius Kambata, Senior Advocate. Now, I would request Justice Nariman and the eminent panelists to hold the book on their right for a photo op. I congratulate Justice Nariman on the launch of his new book. Now, I would request the audience to sit back and relax today's very interesting conversation between these stalwarts of the Indian judicial system. <clears throat> Uh, Justice Patel, I would request you to please begin the session. Thank you very much. Good evening to everyone. It's a singular privilege and honor to be here today. Let's start with Justice Nariman himself. Uh, may I ask you, Rointon, to tell us a little bit in your own words about this two-volume work that is launched today. Good evening to all of you, especially Justice Sri Krishna, Gautam Daraes, and gentlemen. This is a work whose birth was in the pangs of COVID, if I may put it that way. I had something like six weeks of being incarcerated at home with nothing to do. And I always had this as a project, having spoken at the uh, Desai Memorial Lecture a few years ago on four great dissenters of our form. So I got to working extremely hard in those six weeks and ultimately writing this book. This book is divided into about eight chapters and there are four or five of them in volume one and the others in volume two. After the introduction, the first chapter deals with the need for dissent. In many ways, this is the most interesting chapter because it takes you through civil law country jurisdictions, common law country jurisdictions, the Privy Council, which was our Supreme Court till independence, etc. And gives you the pros and cons of allowing a dissent or not allowing one. In civil law systems, for example, where you have judicial and administrative duties mixed. It wouldn't do to have a dissent because things then muddy the waters. Whereas, if otherwise you are a judicial body, there is no reason why 
think the opinion should not be given for various reasons that are given. Interestingly, the Privy Council being a council which advised the king from 1627 onwards made that advice in one voice. The result was even the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council as a result kept giving that advice only in one voice. And dissent, therefore, was not something which was part of Privy Council ethos right until the 1960s. An interesting thing is stated in the book about Justice Jaikar, who happened to be a Privy Council. There was some intricate Hindu law problem. The two English law lords differed from Jaikar and then asked law, uh, the senior law lord asked Jaikar to write the judgment in accordance with what they thought. So these are the interesting twists and turns in that first chapter, which is perhaps the most interesting writer. The second is also interesting and it's entitled When the Chips Are Down. This is dissents and notable dissents which are extremely courageous ones right through the world wars and through our emergence. World War I, you had Lord Shaw speaking for instance, in Rex versus Halliday. In World War II, you had Lord Atkins speaking for instance, in the famous Lewis Express. Coming closer to our to, to India, 1976, you had the courageous Justice Karna dissenting on all points from the majority, for which, of course, he lost his chief justice. Which dissent, therefore, was perhaps the most famous of the law. The interesting thing is that though in war time the laws seem to bend, in peace time, in high time, one of the majority judgment was later declared wrong, sometimes after 16 years. The next chapter deals with dissenting judgments as a stabilizing force, where the dissenters now tell the majority, you have no business to change the law and unsettle it. What I mean in such very interesting way. Then you have dissenting judgments as the agents of change. And here it's remarkable that you have one of the first judges of our court, Justice Fazal Ali, having six notable dissents in about two and a half years. And three of them, in fact, became law. One became law, in fact, two became law almost immediately by virtue of the First Amendment that was passed. And his view of Article 21 then became law 21 years, about 20 years later. You also have famous dissents like those of Justice Sina, Chief Justice Sina at that time in Atyavari's case, which then became the law by a larger bench, something like 60 years later. And you have other famous judgments like Kharak Singh, Hevdasan, Sajjan Singh, etc. These are dealt with. They are all interesting. The next chapter then is great dissents which have now not become law. In short, the spirit of the law continues to hover and brew. Now, among these are an outstanding dissent again by Justice Sina in Sardar Saifuddin Saib, the Bora experiment. Justice Bachavad's judgment in the celebrated Bodak Justice Palekar's judgment in the celebrated Kesavananda case. <laughs> 13 judges, which is the maximum number of judges who ever sat in private. And Justice Venkatachalaya's dissent in Antule, which was a very courageous dissent and a remarkable one in that he was the baby judge of the court and he descended on each and every point. We then come to volume two. And what is interesting in volume two is first the four gentlemen who have called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Because these are all persons who are constantly telling you that, look, everything is going to break down unless ultimately our dissents become law. And of them, I've already spoken of Justice Fazal Ali, who I call the prophet, followed by Justice Vivian Bose. And the, title, the chapter is entitled The Law as Literature, because when you read his judgments, they're truly beautiful. And then you come to the champion dissenter of them all, Justice Subaram. He had as many as 53 dissents. He was equal by Justice Sarkar. And whereas Justice Sarkar's dissents never, almost never became law, 
a number of Justice Subaru's judgments later became law and sometimes became the law by himself, rubber stamping his own judgment later. And last of all, then you have the scholar, Justice Hidayatullah, whose 39 dissents are peppered with allusions to literature, poetry, etc. Then you have a kind of mop-up residuary chapter of other notable dissents. And finally, the book concludes. What is important is right at the end, you have a list of judges with their dissents so that you are able to see every single dissent that has been penned from 1950 in our Supreme Court, right up till the time of publication of this book. Before handing it back to Gautam, there are only two reasonably interesting footnotes that I wish to allude to. The first is at page 210 in volume 1, which deals with Justice Ashok Mathur's sole dissent in state of Gujarat versus Mirzapur, which was a judgment which dealt with the constitutional validity of the Bombay Animal Preservation Gujarat Amendment Act 1994. And this is what I have to say about it. Interestingly, the six majority judgments in Mirzapur were vegetarians. There is no doubt that if a chief justice, as a master of the roster, wishes to ensure a certain result, he can so constitute a bench which may overrule an earlier judgment based on personal preference and predilection rather than constitutional law. By way of contrast, the composition of the bench in Shairaban would show that the bench was carefully selected by the then chief justice. So that when dealing with the constitutional validity of the practice of triple talaq, the bench consisted of one Hindu, one Sikh, one Christian, one Muslim, and one Parsi, that is myself. The composition of the bench therefore yielded three judgments. The dissenting judgment of Kehar CJ accepted by Nazir J did not strike down triple talaq as being unconstitutional, observing that the said practice was part of the personal law of Sunni Muslims. However, Kehar Sija would have injuncted the practice of Tipal Talak until appropriate legislation was passed by parliament to regulate. I was joined by Justice Lalit, where we said that Section 2 of the Sharia Act of 37, which recognized and enforced the practice of Tipal Talak, was manifestly arbitrary and therefore violative of Article 14. Justice Kurian Joseph concurred with us at the end. The other interesting allusion is to a boy genius who was made a judge at the age of 32, Justice Syed Mahmood of the Allahabad High Court. And this is what I have to say in a footnote when I deal with this great judge and some of his dissents. This happens to be at page 4 of the second volume. Many great geniuses had completed their work on earth by this age, that is 32. For instance, the great Shankaracharya not only expounded on Advait in several writings, but it also traveled the length and breadth of India, setting up four religious months which continue till today by the time he disappeared at this very age. Likewise, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, one of the greatest composers in Western classical music, had by age 35, when he died, composed major works for every genre of Western classical music, numbering and all, 600 odd extant works. There were any number which were never published in his lifetime. Alexander the Great, having wiped out the Persian Empire and after having founded 20 odd cities, had also completed his life's work by this age. Back to you, Gautam. Thank you. Uh, we've all had time over the last few days, perhaps not as much as we would have liked, to go through this book. I think I have probably run out of adjectives to say that it is a magisterial work is probably an understatement. It is, I think, fair to say that there hasn't been a work like this uh, in India, possibly for a very long time, perhaps even ever. We'll get into those reasons by and by as we go through these discussions. I don't want to spend more time on this. I'll come to Justice Sri Krishna uh, immediately. But the fact that it has been put together in such a short period of time and with this quite extraordinary level of both analysis and insight and of course the monumental research that has gone into it 
But above all, after I think a very long time, I was saying this to the Ras just last evening. Here's a book on law in two volumes that is quite literally a joy to read. And that I think says quite a lot. Uh, Justice Sri Krishna, your thoughts on the book itself, and then we'll get into some I, specifics. Let me pick it up from the last point that Ravindra made. There's a very famous saying in Sanskrit. Guna Guneshu Pujyant, Guna, guna Guneshu Pujyant, Nacha Lingam Nacha Vayaha. The qualities of a human being are appreciated, not the sex or the gender or the age. So if you are 37, 32, it doesn't matter. If you are outstanding merit, that should be recognized. Having said that, of course, it's always a pleasure to sit with uh, my dear friend Rohinton, whether in private or on a public platform like this. And I must say, this is the second time I've been given this opportunity. One was when he published his book on the disparity religions, uh, Florentinism, and he invited me to speak about comparative religion. Now, <clears throat> about this book, the only thing is this, instead of having a contrived majority in a judgment, like we all saw what happened in Ayodhya judgment, it is as if a whip had been issued. It happens in the legislature that even if you think that it is wrong, you are not allowed to speak against it. That is totally curbing the, the individuality, the freedom of speech of the judge himself, and that is opposed to the constitutional ethos. Now, if a judge thinks that, after all, what is the oath that a judge takes, at least in the higher courts, that he will be true to the constitution and abide by it, that is the fundamental precept on which one becomes a judge of the constitutional court. Now, if that means that he is going to just say yes to somebody else's thinking, he has abdicated his uh, obligation. It is his job to speak of what he thinks of the constitution and speak it out boldly in the face of overwhelming majority. And those are the judges that uh, Brother Rohinton has identified and really analyzed with the meticulousness that he is going to. Now about his scholarship, about his youthful energy, about his uh, articulate behavior, whether at, at the bar of which I had enough uh, experience, on the bench, of course, I did not have, but in reading his judgments, I did get an idea of it. And the amount of research that has gone into publishing a tome like this is really remarkable and commendable. I must say that I did guess that this book was coming in because the last time I met him on a public platform, he just casually mentioned me and mentioned it to me and said, hey, I am thinking of writing a book like this. Whenever I do it, you must be on the platform. I said, thank you. That's a great honor to me. And I'm indeed great. I congratulate him both for his ability to write such a brilliant book. And I must confess, I got this book only on Sunday or Monday evening. And I didn't have time to read 1,000, 1,200 pages. I counted the total number is 1,500. But I assure you, Ryan, that I'm going to read it. I enjoy reading it. There are very few books that I really enjoy, particularly on law. Now, this is going to be one of my uh, uh, revert measures which I shall do. I hope that this, you know, I have read a number of books published in India on law, and most of them are of the nature of digest, you know. You refer to this case, you refer to this case. The ability to look at a judgment and say why it is right or why it is wrong is something that is not given to anybody. And that is the quality that stands out in this kind of thing. Let us come out with the pen of. Uh, uh, Justice Rohinton Nariman. May God give him the energy, the ability, and the long life to produce more and more volumes like this for the bet betterment of all the persons serving the legal world. That's all that I need to say. Thank you very much, Justice Sri Krishna. Uh, Daras, your thoughts generally first. You're muted. Can I be heard now? Yeah. 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 When I first saw these two volumes, I was dumbfounded because I knew that they'd taken Rowington just six weeks to write. Even without the time frame for writing these volumes, 
this is really a brilliant treatise, as you said. And it is amazing that a sitting judge of the Supreme Court, with all the pressures of time, with, with or without COVID, could toss off a book like this, uh, with all the analysis and criticality that Justice Sri Krishna just spoke about. It's not just a great piece of legal writing. It's, it's a very important book because it tells us what judges are meant to be and what judges can be. The message that comes through, and I also confess, I haven't read the whole book, but I've dipped into lengthy sections of it. It's very interesting. It tells us that judges have to be courageous. They have to be independent. They have to have integrity, intellectual and all other integrity. And they also have to have a fairly high intellectual prowess. These are all qualities which Rowington, of course, has in the fullest measure. The book sends this message that particularly as far as constitutional law goes, it's not an objective, as Justice Sri Krishna said, for everyone to agree on the conclusion or the path to the conclusion. In fact, it's probably better that they don't agree. And I'll, I'll shortly come to why I say that. Rowington himself has always trodden his own path, and we see that in his judgments. I mean, he has emphatically personified what Justice John Marshall said in 1803 in Marbury and Madison, that the province emphatically of the judicial department is to say what the law is. And in all his judgments, he has said what the law is. But when you read this book, you realize that many great judges like him have also said what the law is, and they have not necessarily been part of the majority, but many of them have been vindicated years, sometimes decades later. Liversidge is a classic example. The other gem that he gives us, which I was unaware of, was Justice Vivian Bose's judgment in Nagpur in 1943, just two years after Lord Atkin had said... Tari versus Emperor. That's right. In Devasage, he had said, amidst the clash of arms, must the law remain silent is the question Lord Atkin had posed. And Justice Vivian was emphatically answered by saying, in this country, and it was still a colonial country, mind you, in this country, amidst the clash of arms, the law are not silent. And he was saying this to say that the habeas corpus provision in the old uh, CRPC still had play even after the Defense of India Act and rules of 1939. So dissents do matter. They have a they have an effect outside their their ken. I think everyone's favorite dissent, and I I don't use the word in a in lighthearted way. In fact, the most classic dissent of any Indian judge has to be Justice H R Khanna's dissent. I mean, the sheer courage, the intellect, uh, and the boldness to stand up to his four very powerful colleagues at the height of the emergency will probably never be rival. I remember the New York Times ran an editorial at that time saying that every town, village and hamlet in India should erect a statue in honor of this man. Unfortunately, that has not happened as much as it should have. Of course, we have his grand portrait in courtroom number two in the Supreme Court. One of my other favorite dissents, which cannot find place in this book by an Indian judge, uh, and it cannot find place because it's not a dissent given in the Supreme Court, is of Justice Pal sitting as the Indian judge in the international tribunal set up in Tokyo. Okay. Judge war crimes of the Japanese leadership. And he had the guts and the courage to dissent, acquitting all on the grounds of ex post facto laws, that colonialism itself was never under trial, that the tribunal was not properly constituted because it didn't have any Japanese member. These are acts of great courage, great foresight, and the book abounds in examples like this. Many of you, of course, know that the law of freedom of speech, which some of us take for granted today, which Justice Narimara expounded brilliantly in Shreya Singhal's case, actually was born out of several dissents. In 1919, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, the US Supreme Court, joined the majority when he enunciated the clear and present danger test. But just a few months later, and that's a different and interesting story, he and Brandeis dissented by saying, whether in times of war or otherwise, 
the principle of free speech must remain the same it also in trying times they were they were talking about the then sedition act they were dealing with communists anarchists etc and as justice home said in a later judgment in rosika schumer it's freedom for the thought we hate but all these all this purple prose was all part of dissents another great dissent was in olmstead justice brandeis in 1927 in a wiretapping case first spoke of the right of privacy and the right to be let alone and even in the us it took until 1969 in the brandenburg and ohio case to emphatically accept the clear and present danger test and so the dissents of homes and brandeis then became law some 40 years later and in 1972 and griswold the right to privacy was recognized which our supreme court also recognized in the putuswami case and thankfully and emphatically overruled adm jabalpur thus vindicating justice hr khanna so it's a remarkable book where you'll pick up a lot of gems material and i want to leave you all with this this thought the first chapter as rowington said is very important as dissent matter today unfortunately in our society the word dissent occupies a somewhat suspicious place people are suspicious of it is dissent the same as protest is it only someone who's trying to break the beautiful narrative certainly a dissent by a judge can never be that because a dissent by a judge is an alternative path to an alternative solution which may or may not be valid at that point of time but which will appeal to the future but a dissent is always important because its creativity its this new found word disruptiveness which always is a positive thing and it also keeps the majority on its toes because they sharpen their judgment and perhaps place it on narrow grounds so you'll get all of this from this book it's a wonderful read and there's so many thoughts that come to mind but i want to end with only one thought that sometimes great dissents are not always followed immediately justice oliver wendell holmes's dissent in the lochner case concerning bakery laws in new york where he warned against substantive due process and thereafter the american court went into 30 or 35 years of substantive due process interfering with and setting aside laws made by the government purely on policy grounds it's very relevant to us because now we have this doctrine of manifest arbitrariness a doctrine which justice tariwan himself was very fond of which is used to strike down laws and my fear is that the wise words of justice oliver wendell holmes of 1905 must now find echo because we have to also seek some parameters and some guidelines as to when this doctrine can be applied but that's again for another for another day it's a beautiful book it's a, it's a good read even for non lawyers so congratulations rowington it's it's a great show thank you very much duras uh rowington has given us uh, an overview of the book but let me just now give you a few thoughts about uh, the book itself there are two things that are remarkable uh the commentary is interspersed with fairly long and detailed passages now this is not a distraction it's a great advantage because you don't have to leap to some volume or do do the research to look at the passage that justice nariman is talking about to substantiate his argument but the second if you take a step back from the book is the way the book is actually structured and there is a for want of a better word and i'm sure this will appeal to him a sort of symphonic coherence to the structure of the book each section in volume 1 for example is independent but is intimately connected with the one that went before and the one that follows now if you look at the first chapter which is the philosophy the need for dissent why do we need dissent this segues into what is perhaps the most crucial part of dissent which is dissent in a time of crisis or as the book says when the chips are down from there we move to another uh, segment another movement if you like which is where the discussion is about dissent as being stabilizing forces telling the majority don't do this because you are breaking with a body of law and you are going to create dissonance or discordance 
in the times ahead the next chapter gopalan romesh thapar bridge bhushan is the one where the descent say watch out if you do this you are not looking at the sign posts the danger sign posts that lie ahead and the last chapter which ends this first volume is where the descent <coughs> is still as justice lerman puts it the brooding spirit it is still thinking the spirit of the law is still in cogitation but this is where we have i think something of a tension uh early in the book there is a quote from justice holmes uh saying that dissents are largely useless then this charles evans hughes uh, tells us why it is important there is a conflict here a tension here the need for a dissent is explained in chapter 1 versus the need for certainty in the law which perhaps as many have argued is the foundation of the rule of law now when you look at these two they seemingly conflict justice shri krishna any thoughts on this on this conflict between a dissent as a protest as a voice of opposition and the need for not conformity but certainty in communicating to the people that this is the body of the law gautam my own view is that it is always better to have another point of view so that you will be able to reflect on whether you are rightly thinking or not now can i give you a classic example in the bhagavad gita the good lord is talking nobody dare to interrupt him but arjuna had one simple answer and says ियोरिटीस how the necessity of a dissent is absolutely there how the dissent can act as some kind of a break on the majority running away with the um, with the law on how the brooding spirit of the dissenter is that or on picked up by the legislature or by a larger bench or another bench to become the actual law of the country now this now that i think if i remember rightly lord atkins of the loan judgment Dissenting judgment isn't in his. What is that? Yes, Liversidge. Liversidge. Yes. Liversidge case, correct. Now, he poor man. He shouted at the top of his voice that nobody heard him, and then they overruled him. And finally, he was vindicated when the law was subsequently enacted to ensure the fundamental rights of the uh, British people. That is the spirit of the law, and it is the spirit of the law, and as the. Uh, telling described it one of the judgment there are timorous souls and there are brave souls yeah now it is the brave souls who will ultimately rule the rule that's Good. my thinking thank you uh, so there is there are two points here which i think uh, justice nariman makes uh, actually between the first few chapters there is this concept of salvaging for tomorrow by the dissent itself that those are the words at pages 1920 and the dissent as a testimonial to the character and independence of the judge and therefore the judiciary which is really what tells the people that look this is an independent judiciary and that's the confidence as opposed to certainty for the sake of certainty any thoughts on on that i i think that's a very valid point because one of the things i was going to say was precisely that that it's not only for the majority to check itself censor itself fine tune its judgment it's also for the citizenry after all all of this is for the citizenry and for the people and if they have a confidence that there are opposing voices which discuss an issue thread bare i think there's a confidence that whether right or wrong a fair result for that point of time has been reached 
it's not a contrived result it's not an imposed result and i think that also puts, gives a lot of confidence in the system uh dissents are not always good uh, let, let's not let's not also get carried away and, and i think the best test and it's a very broad test was given by justice brandeis himself and he was one of the great dissenters as as the book tells us also so he said that in constitutional matters certainly you must encourage dissent it's a good thing because you must have different perspectives constitutional law is like philosophy uh, a thought that doesn't appeal today becomes completely relevant and appeals a year two years 10 years later but he did add a caveat that in other branches of law there was something to be said for certainty now i don't subscribe to the view that in the interest of certainty you must have a contrived majority but in other branches of the law the admonition that arjuna gave which justice shri krishna told us about might have some bearing because in other branches of the law certainty assumes a greater importance uh, than it does in constitutional law constitutional law is meant to be elastic it's meant to change over time it's not meant to be rigid so there is a point of view i don't think uh, one can be emphatic uh, that dissents are good or dissents are bad but i think on the whole a world free of dissents would not be a, a good world at all I, and certainly the dissenting judgment has given so much value over the years that we can't ignore that yeah, i had one thing about right yes, now one one sentence i would say a dissent in a constitutional court is like the opposition in parliament or legislature can you ever imagine a parliament or legislature without any opposition absolutely absolutely That's ridiculous absolutely there, there is some conscience which says hey what you are doing is not the spirit of the constitution please look at this aspect of the matter now that appeals comes from the judicial conscience and it's not cantankerousness or bitterness or as a feeling of being isolated that is the spirit that needs to be encouraged and that is precisely the objective that's of a terrific insight judge that's a terrific insight uh, and that the parallel is really quite vivid uh, let me just take this forward uh, for a moment we'll come to the harbingers of doom and the emergency and the war situations in a moment but let's take this to a, a more technical level our the foundation of our system of jurisprudence based as it is on uh, precedent to a large extent and we have even in this book interspersed uh, denning and candler versus kane for uh, crane for example where the dissent advocates and encourages a departure from precedent now that technically is a very difficult thing to conceive there is a precedent it is being applied in this case and the dissent says no i think we should now move away from that do you see dangers and pitfalls in us in that approach being over applied overused used thoughtlessly because there is precedent for that precedent and just as there is no precedent for the first precedent but this is a case where for example denning said there is authority for what you say but i say to you move away from that authority uh, how would you conceive this working in a system of jurisprudence like ours can i take the may i answer of course you wrote it <laughs> first it very very important to note that president doesn't have the overwhelming kind of you know breathing down your throat thing for a junior judge or for a judge of a lower court the whole object of a president is really to guide now it is very important to remember that every set of facts is different and the rule of law that has been applied is always applied on a set of facts it is therefore very important to sift material facts from other facts it is a hats approach and once you do that and then you apply the principle of law you can say that you haven't gone wrong but 
if you mechanically apply a rule of law to a set of facts which do not demand the application of that rule of law, you can go horribly wrong. So I think what Lord Denning was really trying to tell us was this. Don't be slavish to a president. It is important to first understand what you are applying and then apply it. I am very, very happy, Rohanton, that you've said this and I hope this gets out to all our young students and interns in law school because this is the constant refrain in many publications that come out of law school that if a judgment says this and there is no precedent for it, the proposition must be wrong because it doesn't have the weight of authority behind it. Uh, common sense uh, be blowed. Now, this, it, it can't work like this. This is, a, I think, a very good insight. Yeah, a good takeaway. I, I have another point Being to make. One second. Sorry. Being a philosophical man, Rohinti will appreciate this sentence. Our ancient thinkers told us, Gatanugatiko lokaha naloka paramarthikaha. That means people just go one after another like dumb driven catty without ascertaining what is the principle. The principle is what that you must always look at. Whether yeah, you're in absolutely. The Absolutely. I, I just want, yeah, I just want to make two points. I agree with Rowington uh, that precedents are guidances mainly for lower courts and for judges who are bound by them. And quite obviously, a judge who is bound by a precedent can not follow it. So he can express his opinion and say, however, I am bound by the law, which, which is uh, enunciated by the Supreme Court. But I think there is also a very important point here. The law as we all know, is as creative a field as any other. Now, can you imagine art, science, music, literature being stuck to the rules and the parameters set from time immemorial? There'd be no creativity, there'd be no development after mankind has to develop. And I think very often in law, you can look at the same problem and come up with a different solution 10 years down the line, which is more apt by that stage. And that's why it's important if you've had someone dissenting in the earlier round, you can say, wait a minute, what didn't appeal to the majority then actually makes a lot of sense now. And if we can fashion a majority, why don't we accept this dissent and make it the law? So I think it's very important for the development of the law that dissents are encouraged rather than discouraged. That's a great insight because if you look at it from the perspective of art, all art is essentially dissent, whether it's music or it's uh, literature. Because if it's not dissent, it's merely pap. Uh, it's just conformity. It's pretty pictures on a wall. Uh, the great musicians, and Rondon can tell us this endlessly, uh, were perhaps arguably all dissenters when they broke with established canons uh, that uh, there were before. Uh, let's just move to two more topics. We may run out of time. Uh, the second chapter on war and emergency is actually in some ways a searing chapter. It has not lost its relevance despite the fact that we are dealing with cases that are very old. Uh, Halliday, Liversidge, Korematsu from the United States and of course ADM Jabalpur here which has gained contemporary relevance because it was overruled in Justice Nariman's tenure on the bench. As you pointed out, Justice Vivian Bose in Tari versus Emperor presaged a lot of what was to uh, follow on the question of habeas corpus. The relevance of these dissents and judgments today, apart from the fact that they have now become the law, has it diminished with time, Daraz, or do you think they are as relevant? or even more so now than they ever were before? I think with very, very limited exceptions, all great judgments always remain relevant. And we constantly cite Justice Marshall and Marbury and Madison. Still? Still, that principle of 1803 is seminal to our very jurisprudence even today. But take specifically judgments like Liversidge, etc., Korematsu. Remember what Justice Jackson said in his dissent in Korematsu, if I'm right. He said, because that was a case of purely racial classification. Right. All Japanese Americans who were, were American citizens, even second and third generation, were incarcerated in camps in California on the ground of national security that the Japanese are going to attack the West Coast and 
straight off as a with a like a blank check all persons of racial japanese descent are suspect and they could impinge on national security so it was a law based purely on racial classification and what justice jackson in his dissent there said he said this is like a loaded gun you're giving the executive or you're giving congress a loaded gun which can always be used on some ground of plausible necessity and i am I'm, i'm afraid that that principle remains as valid today in, in many countries including our own as it was when justice jackson stuck his neck out and, and held that in his dissent but justice shri krishna we are i suspect sooner rather than later going to come up with this conflict uh generated for us by covid between those who have for example taken their vaccinations and those who as a matter of principle refuse to take those vaccinations now we will have these conflicts going on whether special provisions should be made whether those will violate a right or a perceived right or a perceived fundamental right would you say that these dissents in times of war and emergency that justice nariman writes about and writes so eloquently about will regain or reassume their importance in the current climate that we are heading into they'll definitely resonate reverberate and echo through the corridors of the courts See, the point is simple there is always a tension in democracy between two principles democracy is founded on tension otherwise you would have oligarchy would have monarchy would have various other dictatorship I mean, in a democracy, ultimately you are trying to find out that which the rule by which everybody in the society, as far as uh, uh, possible, can be kept happy, without violating the basic necessities of a human being. Now, the test can only be: is it a basic necessity that needs to be curtailed somehow in order to give society a better, better life? Now, talking of vaccination, I may have. some kind of a personal inclination to say i don't like vaccination i have got some uh, uh, take for example the sabari mala judgment so as a religious man i would have said hey you can't do this or take for example the butcher's cases i would have said eating meat is abhorrent to me eating beef of course is un- i would have said sure sure as a religious man but sitting on the bench it is my job as a judge to weigh the constitutional proprieties and come out with a principle And that is exactly what needs to be done, and that that is why it is Bryant and rightly mentioned and said, you can't pick all vegetarian judges to hear the butcher's case. You can't. Okay, so that was the dilemma that was posed to me when I became uh, to head the commission. That here I was a practicing Hindu with a tick on his face every day sitting in the court, called upon to decide a clear case of conflict between two religious sects. And would you? and i i remember the chief justice said that was to me that i expect express a little reservation on the ground she said when you don your robe and sit in the court are you a hindu muslim or what i said no i'm just a judge he said go ahead you will do it and by golly i did it that's the way it should be okay. that's the way it should be. that's correct we remember those days uh, just judge absolutely yeah. sorry kitki are we uh, running out of time sorry you're muted i'm mute we can't hear you Oh. we could uh, discuss maybe another point and then then i'll take the yes all right uh so then, okay then let me just uh, quickly go to the next the last point that i wanted to discuss which is the distinction between volumes 1 and 2 uh between the great dissents and the great dissenters uh i think it's it's it actually made me go back to it more than once to understand why we've draw why justice nariman has made this distinction uh, as you said judge the uh, justice khanna in adm uh, jabalpur is undoubtedly one of the great dissents of all time just as lord atkins was in liversidge and there lord As- atkins was under pressure to tone down his language uh, and got a public uh, rebuttal in the newspapers unheard of in those days and hr khanna has a beautiful passage in his book neither roses nor thorns when he predicts the consequence of his descent uh, sitting in rishikesh with his family his wife and her sister 
and saying this is going to cost me everything. Uh, he knew it. He saw that this was coming. But the great dissenters are showcased, literally showcased, uh, in volume two across a range of subjects. Now this is perhaps a different kind of approach to this. What are your thoughts on the selection of the four names that Justice Nariman uh, has picked up? I think the question should really be addressed to Noreen and he will be able to answer it better. So I have no idea what went into his mind when he picked up these kinds of cases. I'm sure because he he's didn't. picked for. He's picked for. He says with the reason. I mean, I want to know whether you dissent from his choice. <laughs> Frankly, I haven't had the time to read through the two volumes. All right. <laughs> but I do. As, I, I do see the distinction between dissent as a philosophical or a uh, intellectual product and dissenter which would include the intellectual product plus the personality. Maybe that distinction has been maintained by him. I have That's no right. Idea. Because uh, Daras, we heard the lecture in Bombay and That's these right. were the great dissenters. That's an unusual thing. What it knows is. about the great dissents, but to take the individual as a dissenter, as a no, character no, trait. That's, that, that's treading on very thin ice because the moment you mark someone as a dissenter, then immediately, ipso facto, you are devaluing his dissent because then the dissent is not based on intellect alone or an intellectual disagreement. It's based on a personal proclivity to dissent. But that's not what's happening in volume two. That's right. Now, I don't, therefore, I don't think that that's what volume two says. Though they are called the great dissenters, it's just that they wrote a number of great dissents. I think it's meant in that sense. And to that extent, Correct. Uh, the, the uh, description for Horseman of the Apocalypse may not be completely accurate. So as Rowington knows, of course, that was a description used for those four judges of the US Supreme Court who used to strike down all the New Deal legislation of Roosevelt. Correct, and correct. led him to even do a court packing plan, which thankfully never came into operation. So I don't think these four dissenters uh, set about with any mission to dissent. I think no, that's, no. Not, that's not what it means. It only means that they maybe had the intellectual strength and the courage to be able to write a dissent every time they felt it was necessary. But Deras is also not about numbers because uh, as the book, the very early pages of volume 2 point out, there are others who had a larger number of dissents. So this is not just the numbers. These are people who intellectually rigorous wrote great dissents but did this more often than most. More often than most. And, okay. and uh, each one of them had a huge contribution to our jurisprudence uh, you know, I, in the years I, they followed. I, and and the, 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 the wonderful part of a constitutional democracy and a constitutional court is we can still sit and debate. I personally don't agree with Justice Fazal Ali's dissent, Bridge Bushan and Ramesh Thapar, which led to the First Amendment. I think there are problems there. Other people think it's a great piece of judicial writing. And, and I think both views have, have, a, have a legitimacy. Uh, and I think that sometimes uh, non-lawyers tend to think of law as mathematics. This yeah. or that. I don't know. Yeah. And that's never so. That's never so. That's never so. Well, that is epitomized in Holmes's greatest statement. The life of the law is not logic, it is experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Point, uh, Darius, it's interesting. Uh, everybody thought that science was a precise thinking. That science was born into precision, continued in precision, ended in precision. Sorry. The quantum theory tells you something totally drastic about it. The quantum theory says that there know. is nothing permanent, there is nothing absolute, and everything is subjective. Of course, the Shankaracharya to whom Rohindal alluded said that precisely in specific terms. Right. And incidentally, you are talking of dissent. The great master has had his defense. The Sureshwara Acharya, his first principal. Uh, uh, Mandan Mishra. Yes. Yeah. In, fact, in fact, think of it. Every he great prophet. His master on several items. Of course, he finally agreed with the philosophy, but smaller points on which he totally disagreed. Every yeah. messiah, you're right. Every messiah is a every, dissenter. Every prophet has been a dissenter. Correct. He said, would have had that religion without dissent. Gandhi was a dissenter. Tilank was a dissenter. Savarkar was a dissenter. And there were millions of others. 
But why do we say that these are the dissenters and don't recognize their others? Because of the characteristics of their uh, like, personality. Okay, we could go on for hours, but I think we'll run out of time and Kitki is getting a little agitated here. So, yes. <laughs> let's see that. Just, let me just wrap this up by saying, uh, if this discussion is anything to go by, go by the book. It is uh, it's not a decision you're going to regret. You can spend hours and hours with these two volumes and each reading will bring its own rewards. Uh, really, seriously, not to be missed. Guru Kitki. Gobind Singh approach. Sorry. This is the Guru Gobind Singh approach. Which is what? After me, no other guru. It is <laughs> I, I want to say one thing. I want to say one last thing. I think seeing Roington's books, uh, I think he has not just a thought career. This may be the epitome of his career. If he contributes to thinking, whether on religion or on law, with books like this, this will really uh, will be a, a, a national treasure. Yes, we look forward to the years ahead and many more works in Brighton and many more discussions. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we have time only for. He's got very little time left. Okay. Uh, we have time for a couple of uh, questions. Uh, I'll, the first question is uh, Justice Nariman, how do you think dissent has undergone a change in the Supreme Court? when compared to the days of Justice Khanna or Justice Sarkar. Is dissent a matter of courage too, or is it just about an alternate reading of law? Uh, it's a very interesting question, and the answer is in the fact that in Justice Khanna's day, and if you go even before Justice Khanna, in the days of the first court, you had very few cases. So the result was that you had a lot of thought you had a lot of time, you had a lot of discussion. Today, you have an avalanche dropping on us every single day. And I'm telling you as a Supreme Court judge, the difficulty of being a Supreme Court judge today is insurmountable. The earlier, my earlier forebears had nothing of it. And the very fact that we can write dissents even today is something remarkable. I mean, given this massive turnover, almost every day turnover, by the time you've finished reading one brief, the other has come on your table. By the time you've dictated one judgment, there are three others. Physically, the time is not available today. It is not as if people do not dissent or do not think. The difficulty is sheer time. Time is against us. The fact is that this is today a national court of appeal. It is no longer a constitution court. Uh, I'll just take one more question. Uh, given the maxim, no one shall be a judge in his own cause, isn't there an inherent slippery slope in the ability of the apex court to set its own ambit and be its own arbiter without any real accountability to the people? Uh, collegium system being a benign example. This is a bit off topic in my view, but uh, I will... Let's answer it. Let's answer it. Let's, let's, let's see if Justice Nariman wants to answer it. Let's answer it. No. We'll answer it. See, Ultimately, the buck, buck stops somewhere, right? It has to stop at the Supreme Court. As Justice Jackson famously said, we are not final because we are infallible. We are infallible only because we are final. And then he went on to say, if there were a super Supreme Court, I have no doubt they would overturn a number of our decisions. So the buck stops somewhere. The facetious approach would be to say that this really is the doctrine of necessity and necessity knows no law. But the real answer is that the buck stops here. And since it stops here, it is far better that you trust a body of judges who are unelected to, and who do not have to face repeated elections to lay down constitutional law in a kind of continuum, not dependent upon the votes of the next election. That's uh, all right. Uh, sorry, Kitty. Uh, no. Would you like to say something, sir? No, no. Thank you so much, uh, Justice Nariman. Uh, I would just request uh, all the panelists and Justice Nariman to please hold the book up once more. Uh, for, volume uh, one or volume two now? Uh, volume two, please. Volume two. Likes the change of color. 
Thank you so much. On behalf of the foundation, I would like to thank Justice Nariman, Justice Sri Krishna, Justice Patel, and Mr. Kambada. Thank you so much for an, a very invigorating session. I would also like to thank our presenter, Sri Cements Limited, and our associate, Penguin Random House. And last but not the least, thank you to all our patrons who make these sessions possible even during these difficult times. Stay safe and stay well, everyone. Thank you all. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.